Cool. Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Minacho, and this is Be Ready Orcus. And this is our um, second meeting of 2019. Um, I am one of the organizers of this event, along with Corey Harrington. We are both just totally passionate, disaster prepared um, citizens of Orcus, and we want to share this knowledge with the I also wanted to share with you that um, the Orcas Food Co-op, in which I am a member and manager, uh, is having a great sale on um, prep your pantry items. So basically, disaster preparedness that you can take home with you and make sure that you have enough um, food on hand when maybe we don't get ferry service for two weeks or um, all the other types of scenarios. Um, so basically, you can get anything from the UNFI catalog, which is uh, where we get the most of our food from. And you're not, if you're a member, you're not paying anything above catalog pricing. So you're basically getting a super great deal on 25 pound bags of black beans or um, a bunch of canned food or anything that will keep your um, self and your family and your community alive and well and healthy and comforted during disaster. Um, scenarios. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Corey, who is going to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Outstanding. I'm sliding over so that I can see myself in the screen here. <laughs> uh, we're recording, not because I like to be on camera, we're recording uh, the meeting so that we can share it online. Um, I, I expected there would be more people here tonight. As you all know, the roads are bad, the weather's bad, and I expect most of them couldn't make it. Um, and so we're hoping to share all the content um, online and afterward. Um, keep that mind cheap when you're uh, up here. Anyway, uh, I'm happy to be working with Natalie. We're happy to see everybody coming back to the meetings to do this. Um, the, come on in, folks. The um, topic for tonight is how is emergency preparedness and how focus fire and rescue uh, integrates into emergency preparedness and what that means to um, us as a community, what it means to the department. Um, and I was hoping to kind of share share how all that kind of uh, gels together. If you haven't called 911 yet on Orcus, good. Uh, if you ever do, uh, you'll get a, hopefully some insight as to what that means. And um, I think it's especially important uh, because we live on the island, we have limited resources. I'm not sure that everybody's really aware of uh, what that means and what we're capable of, at least in the emergency response um, aspect. So I asked Chief Scott Williams to uh, put together some information and talk to our group about um, what it means to call 911 um, on any day and also what it means uh, when we have um, inclement weather, when uh, we rely, when we run out of resources, and we rely on um, resources outside of our island. Um, let's see, Chief, I was I fully intended on putting together a little uh, spreadsheet so I could introduce you properly, um, but we had a, I got responded to a call before. Mm -hmm. uh, I came here, uh, Chief, uh, was a is an EMT firefighter. Uh, worked in Florida. Worked in Montana. Took a job in 2013 uh, at the station here as a firefighter, EMT paramedic, um, and uh, was a full time employee before you then took the part time chief position, and then eventually were hired on as a full time chief. Is that right? Nice. Um, that's pretty good. That's from, from memory. memory. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a volunteer with the department. I work with Chief. We've been on um, several scenes, uh, incidents together. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Chief, and I enjoy working with him. Uh, without further ado, uh, Fire Chief Scott Williams. <laughs> Will said from the 2019 most valuable <laughs> year. Yay. I didn't think you would add that to your presentation. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Corey's done a tremendous job this year. Uh, he's been on some pretty critical scenes uh, as the first responder and has done an uh, amazing job. So uh, we thank him for that, and uh, it's good to have him a part of this group. Uh, I've had a little bit of a chest cold the last few days, so if, uh, if I'm not speaking loud enough, please prompt me and I'll try to speak louder. That way everyone can hear me. Uh, I also have whiteboard stuff I like to draw, so I've got stuff in the background to kind of help me keep my thoughts together. Uh, so the plan is to me for me to talk about the department and uh, talk about our, our capabilities and then our limitations and then open it up for discussion uh, and question and answer from you. Also wanted to mention that we're like in the perfect bad weather <laughs> snow uh, turn into ice situation so we'll try to keep the meeting as brief as we can so everybody can uh, get home safely tonight so all right <clears throat> well so we uh, here's my little drawing <clears throat> here's Orcas Island we have seven stations we have the main station here which is station 21 and then we have um, there's one down for Orcas, yeah. Very bottom. We have three three stations on each side. The main station here in East Sound is the only staffed station. So when I talk about staffed, we've got uh, full-time employees, and then we have volunteers. So we're considered a combination department. We have four shifts, and each shift is staffed with two people. Uh, they're both firefighters, uh, one is a paramedic and one's an EMT, so that we can provide that uh, ALS and BLS uh, services. So when we have a response, we really rely a lot on the volunteer backbone of the department in order to provide additional manpower uh, for those incidents. <clears throat> and if we send a crew off to the east side, um, then response that you get on the west side, at least initially, is going to be that volunteer core. So <clears throat> this kind of starts to paint a picture of how do we manage incidents. And it depends on how big the incident is um, and kind of the dynamics. So for an example, a simple EMS call, if we show up at somebody's house and they are unable to walk and they live on the second story of their home, and they've got a difficult driveway and a difficult walkway and things like that, it may require upwards to six to 10 people in order to get that person onto a, uh, a tarp that we can carry them maybe down the stairs, out to the stretcher, and then have to navigate with the stretcher out to the ambulance. So a simple call, which might be back pain, might require multiple people in order to get that individual out of their house. <clears throat> fire scene, depending on how big the fire is, might require three quarters of the department in order to manage that scene. So in order to paint a little bit better picture, let's talk about how many responders we have and what are their capabilities. So of those volunteer responders and staff, we've got about 63, 65 members of the department. Of those, I would say, I did the figures earlier, so I'm trying to paint it into a good picture. Well, we've got about 40 that are firefighters and 40 that are EMTs. That means a portion of those individuals hold both certifications. So we have some that are just firefighters in the department, some that are firefighters and EMTs, and then some that are just EMTs. And not all of the volunteer staff is on the island all the time, just like you, they come and go. And so <clears throat> when we get to looking at what can we handle as far as an incident, it's variable. It's variable with who's on island at the time and who's available. Somebody might be having a family emergency and can't respond. If we look around the room, um, nowhere, or anywhere you go on the island, you're, you're probably gonna bump into a volunteer. So we've got Corey, 
Brian, Dave in the back. I don't think I'm missing anybody. So we've got three people in the department right now that are volunteers and would be available for a call. So getting back to the island and painting a picture, <clears throat> we're starting to experience about a third of our call volume are overlapping calls. What that means is we get toned out for one 911 incident, and while we're managing that incident, we get toned out for another incident. So let's say we get an EMS call on this side of the island, and we've got six to seven people on that call. <clears throat> we get toned out for uh, a car accident over here, that's probably going to require another eight to ten individuals. And not everybody in the department is qualified to drive every apparatus. So what happens when we start looking at our responses on the island is we can start to get spread pretty thin, pretty quickly with multiple incidents. However, the volunteers do an absolutely amazing job toned out to five different calls overlapping this last year and we were able to manage two crucial medical incidents um, and I think uh, no, one, there were three so there's two two bad medical incidents another medical incident a wildland call response which turned out to be a very small and very manageable and then another um, call for fire so we, we pretty much um, tapped out the department as far as what we can do. I don't know how many people know that, so that's what I want to communicate to you tonight and then answer any questions you have. So when we look at the structure of the fire department, I said we have firefighters and EMTs. These are called disciplines, and these are the five main disciplines that we do in the department. We do firefighting, we do EMS, emergency medical services, Rescue, so when we talk about rescue, we're talking about search and rescue, we're talking about rope rescue. Uh, if we have a vehicle accident, our rescue team are the ones that are uh, trained up to be able to get somebody out of that vehicle. We have wildland firefighting, and then we have uh, marine rescue, which we've been building over the last few years. And that's it. So had a few hazardous materials incidents on the island and when we look at hazmat we're trained to recognize the situation kind of build a barrier so to say of how we're going to handle this incident and then we start calling in resources off island in order to really do the operational role of taking care of some sort of hazardous material other things I won't get too deep into I mean there's so many things that the fire service does and we just don't as an agency have the capability to do all of it. So those are our capabilities. If we start to get stretched, let's say we get a, a house fire and it's a big house fire and everybody in the department is working on it and then we need relief in order to be able to manage hours of this type of firefighting, then we start calling on our local resources, which are San Juan Island, Shaw Island, and Lopez. And we all know, how do we get from island to island? Well, it's the ferry. Well, how do you get large fire trucks and manpower island to island? Well, it's the ferries. And they work really well with us. If they have the capability, we'll call them up and say, we've got a fire on one island. Um, we've got personnel and equipment coming from another island help us out and so they'll redirect a ferry to uh, go pick up those resources and bring it. But that takes hours. How many, a lot of you look like you've probably been on the island for a long time. <laughs> At least a couple years enough to kind of experience some power outages and things like that. So You know that we can be inconvenient sometimes, right? <laughs> so that's just life on the island. <laughs> Tough out here. <laughs> well, so if we require more resources, uh, then we eventually go to what we call America. 
Well, everyone's laughing, so good. <laughs> I haven't failed on that front. Uh, so, but those are the capabilities. So we do a great job. We actually manage really well. We've, we've been successful with many emergencies that we've been uh, called to respond to, and yet we have limitations. When we start getting into multiple calls, multiple big incidents, then we can be spread thin quickly. And if we get something like an earthquake or a tsunami or uh, an oil spill, or some of these things that have really been talked about that are potentials, not only for the islands, but for the area, then <clears throat> the fire department is gonna become task saturated. We're gonna be trying to triage the situation, send out our individuals to do best possible logistics they can in order to manage that situation. And hopefully if the, this building is still standing, uh, Station 21 is going to become an emergency operations center. So we're going to have staff here who are knowledgeable in incident command in order to staff the station, direct our volunteers, work with the Department of Emergency Management and any other agencies that we're dealing with to manage this incident. And it's not going to be, we're not going to be able to cover everything. I think most people know that, um, but I just feel like I have to say it. Which I think is why it's great to have you guys here. So, you know, the <clears throat> kind of the end message, and I'll circle back to this over and over again, is the more prepared that the community is for different situations, it's going to make it easier for us as a department to stay organized and respond and, and help out and coordinate. So that being said, I'm going to pause there and just take any questions that you have right now about the department as far as capabilities and, and things like that. Any questions? It's uh, good. Yeah. Yep. Yep. How old is the building? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> the question really is, does it mean? It's only about 10 to 12 years old, I think. I've only been here for five years, so I wasn't here when it was built. Well, if it's um, 10 or 12 years old, then it means it. Yeah, I'm sure it's above and beyond. Yeah, and I, and I would assume so. I just don't like to say, oh, yeah, it's definitely, definitely know for sure. But Although we did go, so part of the training that I'm constantly trying to do is stick, stay on top of the FEMA training, and then the local Department of Emergency Management does a great job in providing different types of training, and they've uh, recently had an earthquake response training where uh, individuals from around the county agencies could go and kind of find out, like, do building assessments, and I'm comfortable with the structure of this station. It's a one story, right? It's two stories. Yeah, yeah we've got, um, th like, this is one story that expands into two stories where we've got living Do you have a shortage of volunteers in any particular area? So a, a, a word we like to use around here is depends. <laughs> <laughs> I would say we get um, always use volunteers. Uh, we're limited into the size that we can grow. Uh, and a great job, but uh, like wildland, <clears throat> uh, if we get a large-scale incident, uh, we'll be, um, depending on the size, that might be an area where we uh, don't have enough wildland firefighters. Uh, the marine rescue, depending on that, depending on that situation, uh, we might have individuals who are not qualified to go out, and so we're not able When we first moved here, I had uh, Max Jones come up yes. and do a uh, uh, firewise assessment. It sounds like that's not happening anymore. Is there 
different qualifications for wildland fire and the more structural fire? Yes. And does do you have to have all of one in order to do the other or how does that how does that breakdown work? If, if one wanted to be a volunteer for you say wildland to the structural firefighting academy in order to participate as a firefighter. And then as a subcategory, we have the wildland firefighting. So and most people who have done one or the other know that it's definitely hazards with mm -hmm. each one. And so um, since we as a fire district say that we provide structural protection, we have to know that uh, everyone who's a firefighter in the department has that uh, education for that. And then um, we also, because of our area, the rural nature, the rural nature of the island, we, we also train people up in the wildland. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Thank you. Actually, going to touch on that a little bit later in the discussion, um, if that's okay with you. That's a good question. We've been trained, so I'm just asking. Oh, okay, good. Cool. I might uh, 
ask you some questions. Uh, oh. I'll let you participate in the discussion. <laughs> Yes. Have the deficiencies in our communications to the mainland been addressed from two years ago? So we now have a link when the fiber optics <coughs> fail, potentially. I'm thinking of the discovery of the, our undersea cables being in poor maintenance, and we've had 911 outages where there's been a lack of ability to bridge to the mainland and I think there was remedial work being proposed microwaves being reintroduced old school redundancy systems have those been put in place and are they all now checked off on our box of things to do from the county investigation that was pretty recent that's a century late issue that was a major worry at one point Recently. Yes, and I, I can't say that for 100% that those have been resolved uh, because we're still tied into that infrastructure. And if that fails, um, then that's going to be like, what's the, what is the, the grand scope of that outage going to look like? Uh, and then we don't have, um, and if I say anything, I'm kind of relying on a few people in the room to help <coughs> correct me. Yeah, I can speak to you about that, and I'd like to speak to you more offline about it rather than, you know, in, in, this, in this session. But uh, for the most part, those those remedies have been enacted that were identified in the uh, outcome of the CenturyLink, uh, okay. the CenturyLink cable break. Yes. Thanks. So if, if no, nobody else in the room knows him, this is uh, Dave, and uh, he's with the Department of Emergency Management, so he's a great resource for us, and also in Occasionally we have members uh, who are at the station, um, but uh, it's not a staffed station. Okay. It was built with the intent of as, as the department grows that there's the possibility of that. That's why it has a kind of a residential living space in it. Rescue have any boats, or is it all other people's boats? It's all other people's boats. How does it work if there's a call? How what's the how does it dispatch versus the Coast Guard? So we've actually developed a really good relationship with the Coast Guard, and, and um, probably many of our marine rescue events. Um, dispatched at the same time, fairly close to the same time frame the Coast Guard's been dispatched, and then it just depends on who gets there first. And there's been times where we've both gotten there about the same time, um, and we've assisted each other in facilitating whatever type of uh, medical need or rescue assistance is required. So, yeah, dispatch does a great job, and uh, depending on the complaint, um, We've had kayakers in the water, um, and we've gone out to assist them with that. Uh, so not necessarily a medical complaint, but a rescue and uh, And we've gotten there before the Coast Guard has and been able to help them out. Um, there's been uh, medical incidents where we've gotten there first, and we've required the Coast Guard's help in order to transfer the patient from boat to boat. So. And there's also the outer island aspect of our marine rescue team. Right? You know, if someone breaks their leg on sushi, we go over and go and carry and help transport them somewhere. So do you have designated so speaking of marine rescue technicians? <laughs> so do you have designated boats in all of kind of the appropriate areas? Jared Harbor, West Sound, and Sound or Olga area or something like that? Approved vessels for yeah. us to use. Uh, and uh, like for example the Guardian, which is the sheriff's boat down at the ferry landing. Yeah. Um, that's a boat that we use, and then there's a few private boats uh, that are approved vessels that we need to be used. Um, but we don't maintain them. Yeah, right. They, they could not be there when the, the 911 is initiated, so uh, it's very... Yeah. 
how does dispatch work? Is it local to Orcas or is it mainland? So our dispatch center is on San Juan Island. It's run through the <coughs> sheriff's department, and so they dispatch both um, fire, all three. They put they do fire, EMS, and law enforcement, and uh, it's all located on San Juan Island. And they do that for the entire county. Is there backup dispatch? Uh, <coughs> so uh, during 911 outages and things like that. Uh, on Orcas who used to be dispatchers that we call in and we facilitated a, a local 911 dispatch through the fire department here. So you use your number? Yep. Just a curiosity, but um, I live in Olga just on the south side of Grand State Park. Yes. And I know that we had those crazy winds just over a week ago. There were, what, 30 trees or so down, and I'm wondering if that created a problem with any emergency calls. Um, people deep further out into Olga or Dilbay with all those trees across the road in the park. Um, fortunately, it did not create problems. Uh, it was an inconvenience for probably several people, um, just Power. daily lives and things like that, yeah. Fortunately, didn't have uh, a 911 call that we could not get to because of that. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't always happen. That way. Uh, <clears throat> recently, because of the weather, uh, we couldn't uh, couldn't fly people out. So we're on an island, no hospital, no ER. So when it requires something of that, uh, require those services, we fly people out. And I <clears throat> I want to remind everybody that utilize uh, whatever we can get in order to get people off the island and so there's two main companies that fly people off the island and that's airlift northwest and island air ambulance a lot of us are already familiar with airlift northwest um, but island air ambulance is a company on friday harbor it's a fixed wing and they've got um, de-icing capabilities and things like that so <clears throat> the reason i promote both of those is because uh, there's been times that Airlift Northwest has been fogged in on the mainland and can't get out here because of the conditions there. And yet, as we know, it might be clear out here, and so we can utilize a local resource in order to fly something somebody had been flying into a mainland ER. Um, but recently with the weather, um, they couldn't fly, none of those agencies could fly. Um, the ferry might have a four or five hour wait for the ferries, and so we actually utilized the Navy recently. We had two back-to-back -back calls going on at the same time, so we loaded two different patients onto a Navy helicopter and, and sent them to Harborview. So um, it's, uh, we've got great uh, support from the Coast Guard with marine incidents and uh, with medical incidents and from the Navy. Yes? Um, something that I've noticed is an issue on Lopez is that all of our neighborhoods are kind of a one way in, one way out, and it's it's kind of you can get into a neighborhood and it's on a loop, but that there's only one connection point to the main roads, um, and there's like probably 20 neighborhoods like that on the island. Does Orcas have similar issues, and what are the abilities of the emergency vehicles to chainsaw out a tree or something like that if that that link is kind of blocked off? So we have a few members of the department that are. Uh, they're skilled and qualified with chainsaws, and um, you know, again, depending on the, how many trees are down, right. uh, we've actually been able to manage pretty well with uh, responders going into neighborhoods and helping with trees. So, like, like you're saying, you get into a neighborhood, you've got a tree down, we carry chainsaws on the rigs. Okay. Not every rig, but a lot of them, in order to allow our responders to clear a road and <coughs> <laughs> what are the station capabilities if the power goes out? Are they, is it different for the different stations? Yeah, so we've got a, a generator here, and uh, we've got one out at Deer Harbor, and a few of the other stations have uh, smaller generators. Um, but this will definitely be a uh, power outage, be a functional okay. station.
yeah. rigs and ambulances because if things get isolated, then we start to look at what's available in what area. So with this being the manned station, we have our uh, rescue rigs here. We have a couple of fire apparatus, and we have um, two ambulances. So our first out ambulance and our second out ambulance is housed here. So when you're talking about rescue rigs, are those pickups with winches? What what are rescue rigs? Yeah, it's it's a pickup truck and it has all of our rescue equipment, uh, winches, uh, saws, uh, <coughs> our rope rescue equipment, our vehicle rescue equipment, the marine rescue equipment. Station 23, which is over by Rosario, has the uh, which is just a truck that carries a large volume of water so we, if we get to an area we've got a hydrant we can have water and then a fire truck station 25 has a fire truck station 27 has a fire truck it's just a scaled down version so we call them our wasp engines it's it's on that uh, Ford F550 chassis 550 or 450 it's a wildland and structural protection engine, so it's a little bit more maneuverable in some uh, areas of the island. 22 has one of those wasp engines, so a fire truck. It also has a tender. Station 26 has a full-size structural fire truck, and then Station 24 has a wasp engine. Currently, a tender that's pretty much to service that area. Oh, and Station 24 has our backup ambulance, which is a BLS or basic life support unit and uh, is available for use out in that area. Or if we're getting multiple calls in this area, then volunteers from that area will pick up the ambulance and bring it into town in case we get. Washington State Ferries have any, you know, at the ferry landing, are there any resources? For fire? Emergencies or anything like that? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yes. What do you recommend if you're out of cell phone range or like not near anybody's house? Is there like a ham radio that comes to here? Or what's so we've actually in I think this is correct, but we've got, <clears throat> we, we did an initiative to make sure that we've got ham radio capability in each station. Okay. So in case we had a major incident and, <clears throat> you know, East Sound is wiped out, um, then we've got radio communications on both sides of the island. So yeah, we do have, uh, I believe and it's all functional, we have ham radios in each station. We have ham radio operators that come in regularly and test their equipment. Uh, and so in a big incident, um, Let's say it's uh, we had a major freeze and trees were down everywhere and things like that, power was out, then we would probably staff the station with responders and radio operators to help facilitate uh, a community initiative in order to communicate. Are each of the ferry landings uh, with independent backup power to operate the, the dock facilities? As far as I know, yes. start talking about the ferries I do. They just don't just always, but from what I understand, yes. Yeah. Sure. So the back to the ham radio question, like those aren't just always on and being operated, right? Like what if I'm just out of cell service? Is there any way to contact the fire department in that case? Like you're at home? Like there's not a widespread outage of cell service, but I just don't have it currently. Is there any other way to get in touch with the department or ask for aid? Um, <clears throat> so, just to be clear, because I know this is an important question, so you're saying that if you're, <clears throat> say you're in the Deer Harbor area and there's power outages there and the cell phone service um, is bad or not functional, 
Sure. Yeah. I'm wondering. Or, or it, like I'm on the back side of the mountain with a Verizon phone and don't have service. Yes. So if you're on the back side of Moran, you're hiking, and you don't have cell service, and you've... Um, Is there anything else I could be carrying other than a satellite phone? <clears throat> yep. There's a lot of a lot of phones that don't say they have service will work for emergency calls, though, because they'll have service with them through another carrier, but okay, they don't nice. show it. But we we have experienced situations where um, you know people have been in that situation, uh, and you're you're still on your own. It's too uncertain. When I go hiking on the backside of Moran. And pretty much everywhere I go hiking, I carry the Garmin InReach SC Plus, mm -hmm. which is a small device that uses the radio satellites, and it creates text messages and waypoints, and my wife can go look on the computer and see where I'm at, mm -hmm. and, you know, it does that every 10 minutes, and it has an SOS button, and if I hit that SOS button, then these guys will eventually get a call, <laughs> and, uh, it, it, they will communicate with me. It's two-way, so they'll send me a, what's wrong, you know, kind of text messaging. So it's texting using the Iridium satellite, which is the same thing that satellite phones use. And what, what was that called? It's called the Garmin InReach SE Plus. It's about three hundred dollars. Um, it's a cheap. It's one of the cheapest things, you know. But you have to pay a monthly subscription. Um. And the cheapest one of that is like twelve dollars a month, you know, and then it's on the cart. But it's for exactly that reason, yeah. you know, because I hike alone a lot. Yeah, there's no self service in a lot of that Yeah, and I cool. think that's what's unique about Orcas Island is, you know, we're we're so close to America, and uh, you know, we're a tourist destination. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess I've had lots of experience, but 
your idea uh, that you mentioned about uh, Garmin and also satellite um, has been around for a long time, especially the satellite, and it works. If you're a mountaineer, which we are, much as the sun, our sun was uh, up in Alaska on a never been climbed before peak, and uh, we could watch him uh, where he was going on satellite uh, yeah. messages and then coming on the computer. So if you care enough, figure out what you need to do. Yeah, it's I'm there. Sure. I've checked mine with hiking like a long turtle back. I used it today, for example. And in some areas you have cell phone coverage. The backside of turtle back, a lot of that area has cell phone coverage. So I can see via a website whether the signals are going through. Right. They typically go through in like 20 minutes. It's not instant. But 20 minutes is a hell of a lot better than overnight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I will carry it, you know. And, and there may be a few spots in Moran that are deep in valleys, but even there, it just takes one hit to transmit a tiny, a few bits right. of a message, and your GPS coordinates are transmitted along with the SOS. And one hit, and they're on their way. You guys would respond if you got a phone call you know, and there was this legitimate thing and they already called the wife and she said go get him you'd be all over <laughs> <laughs> assuming she says that <laughs> you may, you may use this opportunity to segue into an inter have you guys had to respond to any calls like that yet that, that came from an EPER or, or somebody's emergency locator device that somebody from a back channel got hold of me and said, hey, you got somebody on the back side of it. It happens occasionally. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Especially in the park. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> to give a few examples of, of things where <clears throat> um, we've been task heavy, so the 911 outage, uh, when that happened, of course, you know, the whole county recognizes that it's an issue, and then we know that there's like basic needs that people on the island have, and so we we mobilize and we try to figure out the best plan. And so when that happened, we organized as many volunteers as we could. We got them into groups, sent them out to the, uh, the different station areas, and then had them go house to house in order to make sure that everyone's okay and find out if there's anybody that's home that needs help that can. Did a great job, but you know that's that's a lot of work, uh, which we don't like doing. But it's a lot of work, uh, and when, the, when there's a time-sensitive issue going on, it's going to take time for us to accomplish the, the large task at hand. Um, we've had search and rescues in the park where uh, we've mobilized a group and we've sent them off. Uh, we've contacted the um, sheriff's department. We've to the Navy because they have the, the imaging capabilities to help and uh, I mean the Coast Guard and uh, you know it's, it's still taken a few hours to locate people um, because of the train and things like that um, so we've done that but it it does the only reason I'm mentioning that is because again I, I, I like what this group is doing because if I were to look at uh, a small incident and a large disaster, the more prepared that the community is to handle either one of those, then it makes it easier for us as a, a combination staff, volunteer, fire department to handle that incident. So when we look at why is this group here and why, why am I talking tonight is um, We'll say I want to give you a pretty good picture of the department, and I can still answer more questions. Um, and I also wanted to encourage everybody to look at the material that the Department of Emergency Management has given you, and uh, you know, start to prepare for yourself, and, and reach out to the community that you're in. Um, 
family, friends, neighbors, kind of initiate these conversations and uh, and figure out, you know, kind of self-assessment. Where where are we with things? So <clears throat> let's say we had an earthquake. Buildings are down around town. Fire department is mobilized. Hopefully, you know, we can set up a command center here, and then we start to redistribute our forces and, and move out into the community. Well, it may take several hours for um, us to really get things somewhat stabilized or at least have a pretty good plan in place. So what are our, what are our, in those, in, <clears throat> during that time, what are the needs? Well, you know, everyone's gonna need food, everyone's gonna need water, uh, they might need medications, uh, they might need fuel for their vehicles or for um, generators and such. Depending on the time of year, they might need heat. Obviously, we've just been talking about communications. <clears throat> we can't solve all that for the, the island, and I think that all of you are aware of that. That's why you're here. And so, <clears throat> you know, if, if we had community groups that were aware of that, you guys could be doing those self-assessments in your community, mobilizing, and then we can distribute our forces out to the stations where we have ham radios and people who are familiar with fire department operations and command to help organize things. And those would become locations for the community to go to with needs. And the more organized you are, it means that maybe a few representatives from all of those areas would be showing up to the station instead of 20, um, which would help streamline communications and um, help us stay organized. I, again, I don't know what everybody's doing. I'm not as familiar with the group that uh, all of you are. But when I look at the resources that uh, DEM has provided, and I might get the Dave up here to talk a little more about it in a minute, but uh, you know, there's a plan page here that you could use to help guide you in, in your planning. And really, you could say, you know, create a community discussion say over the course of the next three months, <clears throat> as many households that want to participate, we're going to prepare. We're going to get food and water. We're going to you know, try to get um, medications stored up, things like that, that you know, as best as you can. Um, and then uh, test things out. So over a three month period, you're prepping, you're planning, you're prepping, and then you're, you're, you're testing it. Uh, occasionally, maybe once a month, you a phone tree and you call around and say hey you know um, are you guys prepared are you at home and you need oxygen do you have enough oxygen do you have a, a, a cylinder in storage that sort of thing and if people aren't as prepared as they need to be then how do you facilitate helping each other out with um, getting them that and then you know things like that can also trickle back to the, the fire department and then we can look at our resources and see how we can help you help your friends and neighbors and family. Question? Yes. In the event of a major event and communication systems are not working, do you have a plan to be able to provide information to the community at each of the fire stations? Yeah, so if we have a major event like that, then we are going to group people together, get organized here, and send them out to the stations. And with our ham radios, if that's functioning like it should, then we will have communication with all of those outlying stations, and uh, we can from there. Do you have like a chalkboard, or how will you communicate to people who like come to the station who want information? Yeah, so that's all based on the whole NIMS uh, National Incident Management System, mm -hmm. and we utilize that along with the County Department of Emergency Management, and we train on it um, annually. And so that would be we would have those things in place. It's, that's a big topic, and I, well, I... Do you want us to physically go to a fire station if we need information? Yes. And we can get there? Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Is, there, uh, is there a capability, like if we had a situation like that? I'm here tonight because we're, we're going to have our HOA meeting next month, and I'm a disaster guy. Okay. And so we're, we're going to have our phone free. Yes. 
right, so yes, it would be good to have a ham radio, and that would give you access to our communications and will facilitate our communications back to you, which would be great. Uh, and then uh, I will say, uh, you know, there's going to be some, it's going to be challenging. Uh, and so in, in having people come to the station and having people on the radio, uh, as interest grows, let's we start with the radio. So as interest grows in that, it would be nice to have our ham radio operators work with members of the community so that we, we build a good system in place for communications and have that discussion and that knowledge. Uh, yeah, like frequencies, yeah, frequencies, frequencies, or, yeah. frequencies, maybe some common language and things like that, uh, radio reports. Uh, you know, we can develop some standardized reports so that you can get on the radio and say, you know, I'm out in Deer Harbor, most buildings are structurally safe. We have no current medical needs. Uh, however, power is out. I can you know, kind of a, a template it. Um, so that way, it's short and sweet, and it paints the picture, and everybody knows what each other is trying to say. Um, having people come to the station, we're going to try to set ourselves up for that purpose. Uh, however, um, get inundated with people then it's it, it may be distracting and so that's something that we're going to try to manage and so if we had like representatives from the community um, that were out getting that information and we had less people coming to the station then it would help us differentiate between information coming in and oh this is an, an emergent need that we have to address does that help on my I, I like having this conversation uh, yeah, and, and then I imagine you'll figure out a system to give the information to people who come here. I mean, we obviously you don't want everyone clamoring at the front desk, so you'll have a better way of communicating than, than that. Yeah, we'll be looking at all the resources that are available to us um, and try to create some sort of communication back out to the community. Definitely. And so, like recently, we had. <clears throat> at a major event we looked at you know if people if there's multiple dead uh, how do we set up a, a receiving place for that and then um, how do we communicate back out to the community and potential people who are you know needing to know that information and so there's there's systems in place through that NIMS model in order to do all of this and we'll do the best that we can however back to what manpower is available to facilitate all that, and we definitely are not as robust as other agencies uh, on the main Do you know if we have a reverse 911 capability here? We do. Yeah, we do. Yes, we do. And they, so do we have to register, or is it sort of semi-automatic? No, nope, it's automatic, and we don't test it. We don't utilize it too much because we want it to be specifically for that purpose. Um, Dave, you're the... Yeah, so you can register. You, it's best to sign yourself up at San Juan DEM.net slash alerts. And the more means of uh, contacting you that you enter into that cell phone, simply, you know, put in your address. And, you know, it's, it's like a method. And it's like a, a, a notification method in the quiver. It's not necessarily the only, you know, guaranteed to work. So, um, but it's, you know, but we have it and... Um, and we always, you know, say like, if you get this message, check with your neighbor to see that they got it. So, because um, it's not guaranteed. Great. The, the high wind warning alerts that came through this time mm -hmm. on the cell phone, and I think on the computer. Yeah. Just, yeah. The yeah. county's Department of Emergency website is actually a great resource yeah. for everyone, especially you know, those like all of you who are interested. Um, I used to be in the weather service for the Air Force, and I've always studied weather, universities, and whatever. And um, it's improved immensely, but um, over the years. But I want to tell people that you know you need to check. If you're really concerned, you need to check the weather frequently um, because 
uh, in our area were, we have so many uh, different influences. And an algorithm isn't a person. It's a very well thought out um, model. But that model uh, makes changes continuously. And so it knows, well, it really doesn't know anything, but it registers <laughs> uh, the likely conditions if things were going to go as our model says. And uh, that changes. If anybody's been watching um, one or two or three or like us, several uh, different um, sources, you see that it changes almost, you know, three or four times a day significantly. And I experienced one of those changes uh, when I was doing something else, and uh, it went from 28 degrees, which, you know, you're not going to have anything freezing, to uh, 20 degrees blowing 40. And that's a big difference. And, uh, well, if you go to the, most likely if you go to the station uh, during that time, you get that information. But if you don't, you're operating on misinformation. And uh, it's a good idea uh, when there are possibilities of emergencies like weather but you check it frequently because the algorithm gets information from maybe a thousand different sources, does immediate compu you know, computation, and publishes a new set of predictions. And um, you. you need to check those things to make the right decision for you. So I, uh, I don't know how long uh, we've planned for this meeting, uh, and I do want to touch on one thing, just because it's been mentioned, and I know that it might be on, on the mind of other people, minds of other people uh, in this group. We have like the CERT teams, uh, and uh, those are um, well recognized national uh, type groups uh, with specific training and specific recognition, uh, and so we were like question has been, you know, do we do we want to develop CERT teams and things like that here? And um, we want to always, one thing that I've learned being on Orcas Island, what do you say? CERT. Yes. CERT teams. What does that mean? Yeah. Citizen, citizen emergency response. Oh. Okay. Citizen emergency response team. Okay. I had no idea. But there's a recognized model for that, a national model with specific training, and it's very robust. Okay. Um, and like I was saying, what I've learned uh, being on Orcas Island and, 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 and dealing with the fire department as community is we always want to do something that's manageable, and manageable for everybody that's involved. And <clears throat> we can't really support a CERT team as far as how it's recognized nationally, but we can use that intent and create something that's sustainable and manageable for this community. I don't know what, what your opinion is. You've been involved in it. Um, what it does is that it takes, you know, I'll just use Orcas as an example, and uh, you would be, the fire department, of course, is the main person, main entity here. But you take each community, Olga, you know, everybody, Deer Harbor, you know, everybody, all, every every area has its own little community. And over that community is a team of people or a person, depending how big it is. Within that, you take all the resources that that community has, whether they have chainsaws, whether they have tractors, whether they have backhoes, you know, all the resources, not just big, but little. You learn all of, about your community. Do you have elderly people that can't move? Do you have you know, all these resources that you need to know? This person or group of people need to know. So when something happens on this island, the east side and the west side are totally different. You can't, you, you know, just totally two different, almost weather groups. So what it does is it takes that, the people in that community take care of their home 
with the resources that they have. If it goes beyond that, then that person or group of people that's over this, that particular community, contact you. Say, we need help, we need this. This is what we have, this is what's happening over here. That, what that does, it takes away the heavy responsibility for you as a total entity in the island here and puts it on these groups. And so it's a very strong community-based helping aid for each other. We learned how to do this in Pennsylvania, where there's many, many rivers, and those rivers often came up very high and flooded. We were in a, an area 20 miles away. We could not get to these people, and the emergency response and the uh, Red Cross would not let us through to help these people. So then we quickly turned it around and got these people that were in the local area to help those people that the floodwaters were rising. We couldn't get to them. The rivers were flowing too fast to put a boat on it. So that's how we wound up doing that. So what it's doing is taking the heavy responsibility and dividing it out so you don't have so much to do and the rest of us pick up the balance. Right. That's, is, that's the whole goal of it. Well, the same message is <coughs> presented well, tonight. Talking yeah. about but life. did you did you have required amount of training or even be on this insert team? I was on a CERT team, but it was under the auspices of the Red Cross. Okay. Yeah. And so it's not as intense of a training as much as it is learning how to help those in your community. And not just, we had forms to fill out, yes. Uh, there were some questions in there about, you know, all the equipment that you have and what can you do and what are your talents and, and who do you have in your community that you know needs help. And those forms were kept with the person in charge yeah. of for the group of people. They're not confidential. They're just, you know, what talents can you have or what do you have that can help the people in here? So as the agencies have analyzed our communities uh, on the different islands around San Juan County, um, what's been discussed is the, the concepts you're saying and that we've discussed tonight, those are our manageable goals for our communities, but to have uh, established and official CERT teams, uh, that's that's a big project. That's a very big project. But you can still incorporate some of their but you methodology can those right? methodologies yeah, into right. what you're doing. Right. And then the big thing would be, you know, to maintain communications with the, the fire department. And a lot of these resources, similar to what DEM has presented to the group. Yeah. So, what what they've done is the Department of Mercy Management and other agencies have looked at that, and we've said, you know, how can we present you with um, some templates to go by, and, and and really that's this material. So it's, I think we're all talking the same language, and we're just scaled down to something that's manageable for the. the Ma'am, would you say then that the, the CERT organization you were part of was more of like a like an organizational structure rather than an actual response team? It sounded like you were like you were trying to like um, get an inventory of all the all all that was available in your area and might need help and all that stuff. So I think I think some people might think of it as a team of people who out rescue folks and other, but it sounds like it's more like a cat a um, cataloging of, of what your resources community it's, and what the needs might be. It's keeping track of what you have and using all the resources that are available to you to help all those around you. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, so we kept you long enough. Hopefully I've been able to paint at least a, a brief picture of uh, the department and uh, enter into some that will benefit all of you in the future. Uh, 
Uh, please uh, take some of the material that's uh, been brought to us tonight by the Department of Emergency Management. There's uh, signs that says it's got a green and a red. I really encourage you to pick those up. Uh, you can post those in front of your house. So if we have a major event and your home is okay, <clears throat> you can post them. So, <laughs> Look at that. If your home is okay, you can post that, uh, and we'll drive by your place, and we'll go to the next home that uh, might have the help sign in front of it. Um, so that's a great resource uh, for all of us. Uh, you can continue to ask through, I don't know how we want to keep this organized, but I think it's best to keep things through. Um, you too. And you guys can work with the fire department and uh, the main thing is that we stay in communications uh, so that um, we can help each other out. Um, I'm gonna, if there's no other questions for me, I'll hand it off to them to close. Um, I want to say how much I like the uh, fire marshal's uh, information also. Uh, that's in like the wildland fires and prevention and measures you can take. And I urge people to go uh, be in touch with the website for the fire marshal or whatever and understand. Um, doesn't seem like it today, but uh, there is danger of wildfire. Uh, and there are things you can do that are very simple. Very we'll get, in, we'll get into that in, towards the summer. We'll have wildly discussions um, uh, to touch more specifically on that. Uh, real quick, I just want uh, everybody to join me in thanking Chief. I think there's <laughs> Before people leave, we came in it, black ice. Oh, out, in the, out in the parking lot, it's nasty. Right down. That's That's why why be we, careful. Yeah. 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 So walk yeah. yeah. visually. Yeah. Very slippery. Yeah. Yeah. It is I'm getting very reports from all over the island now of black, black ice parking. So yeah. be really careful. Though. Yeah. 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 Please. Uh, even, uh, the parking lot is really insane. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's nasty out there. Great. Thanks. So thanks everyone for coming. I just wanted to point out that we. Corey and I are Be Ready Orcas. You guys are all Be Ready Orcas, but we're not actually like affiliated with any of our like emergency uh, any of the departments. Like we're not. We're all volunteers. And uh, I wanted to see if all of you. I wanted to give you a task to talk to your neighbors about where their propane shutoff is and where their water shutoff is. And show them where yours is in the house. That's just like a little task that we can all do right now. All right, thanks everybody.